it's it's fine for um for me to sort of break in and uh you know answer the question this will be really easy going kind of back and forth and uh, i i just don't want anyone to feel uh worried you know or self-conscious just just as we go through ask me anything ask me what's on the top of your head there's you know, no question too crazy or too out there. I'll answer anything, you know. So so just as we as we go on, if something kind of you know creeps into your brain and you're like, I, I don't know if I should ask that. Uh <laughs> ask it. You know, the worst thing, the worst thing I can do is be like, Well, that's actually not true. You know, who cares? And then we'll we'll move on. So with that, again, um, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for the the nice intro, man. And uh, hey, uh, let's get started with any questions that you have or the audience has, and we can just start rolling. Fantastic. So I'll get started with a few questions that I have myself, but then uh, everyone that's in attendance, I encourage you to use the q and I see a few have already come in, so that's great. Um, and yeah, like this is, like you said, this is a, a non-technical talk. So uh, questions for the layman, even if you think it's an obvious question, just ask it anyway, where this is a, a learning experience for all of us. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start out with a simple question. What inspired you to become an archaeologist? Ooh, the, the, you know, it's kind of a long and windy backdoor pathway to archaeology. And I hope as I go th through this um, for you guys listening, you know, think of your own lives and, and realize that it wasn't like from the age of five, I wanted to be an archaeologist. It's like, no, you know, I wanted to be an actor uh, when I first got to college. I'd been in a play in high school and, you know, I'm like, OK, I think I'll try and pursue this acting thing. But I have to say the opposite cliche happens when I got to school. I went to UC Santa Barbara for my undergraduate education. Um, I had three classes my first quarter, two of which were an acting class and intro to archaeology. And what happened was the acting class was like the most boring class ever with the most boring professor. I mean, it was an embarrassment. And then the archaeology class, which is supposed to be boring, right? The cliche is like an old archaeology professor with a big beard or something, was so fascinating. And the, the professor who taught that, Professor Brian Fagan, he was just like a one of the best storytellers I'd ever heard. He made everything sound so cool. And at the end of his class, um, even then, it wasn't like, oh, I need to be an archaeologist. Like, it wasn't some switch that went off in my head. But by the end of that class, I was like, you know, no matter what happens, I want to be that guy. You know, uh, because he had the best stories of travel and, and traveling with a purpose. That's what I wanted, you know, as a young person. I wanted to go someplace far away and just experience it and not just be a tourist. Like, go there. To, to help or to learn or to you know be a part of the community for a while. So with that in my head, like two years later, I realized there was another professor at Santa Barbara, uh, Dr. Annabelle Ford, who took students every once a year to Belize, to Central America, to work for the spring quarter. So it was like three months, you know, in Belize, in the jungle, um, at the Belize Guatemala border, basically just inside on the Belize side, deep in the jungle, just like you would think. And when I heard that from a fellow classmate, I was like, you can do that. Like that's possible in the universe, you know? So I went to go see Dr. Ford for the first time. And, and again, every cliche, I like, I walked in and I was like, um, Dr. Ford. So, uh, I heard that you could like take students. Like, could I do that? You know? And she was very welcoming. She's like, sure. You know, like, uh, I, absolutely. So once I spent a field season doing that, and that's when I was a junior in, in college that sold me. I mean, after you come home from working at the ruins of Amaya city for three months in the jungle, I mean, come on, man, you know, like, uh, statistics just ain't as good of a class after that you know what i mean so after that i just kind of stayed in it like um another field season would come and i would ask doctor i went with dr ford another time and then i was like i graduated and i'm like oh maybe i should do a little more so i uh became part of a different project where i started to work on the cenotes and just as the years went by I ended up having so much field experience by going down to Belize every summer that that's the hard part of being a grad student or getting a PhD or something like that. So I had the hard part kind of ready. So then all I had to do was kind of sell it 
to professors at another institution. I, I ended up going to UC Riverside for my PhD. And, and so that's what kind of inspired me and kept me going in archaeology. It was really just the enjoyment of um, being a part of an archaeology crew and experiences, experiencing this thing called archaeology. Oh, wow. That sounds like an incredible experience. Um, I was going to ask it you. It was great. I was going to ask you how you became interested in the Maya, but it sounds like that just kind of naturally happened from your experience in school. Yeah, it, it's um, and even before the Maya thing, I do have to be honest and just say I was super interested in anything of the of that sort of cliche, a big civilization, you know, so if there was an Egyptologist there, I would have been like, oh, can I go to Egypt? You know, but since there was a Mayanist, I was like, OK, here's the here's the one. You know, and and then as the years go by, I just I really another thing that kept me in the game was I just really love the jungle. I just really like existing in the jungle, walking through the jungle, experiencing it. And sure, it's hot and buggy and tough. And oh, my God, it's rainy. And oh, the road's washed out. But um, I just I like it, man. Uh, so and these kind of feelings that I have, I always hope that anyone interested in archaeology or who's in grad school in archaeology or something i hope they feel the same that they have a draw like that so yeah that's what that's a dream of the maya world it was possible oh that sounds like a wonderful experience um mm -hmm. we had a question from tyler i'll just get into the audience questions here yeah it's fine um so he asked uh what is new in mayan research um it's it's a lot it's a lot of the same and i say that with love it's a good thing like we 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 learn ever more about the same st stuff, but in terms of new stuff, um, LIDAR is a big thing in the Maya world. And and what that is, if you guys uh, haven't heard, it's where a plane flies over the jungle and shoots a bunch of lasers down, like, you know, 50 lasers a second or whatever it is. And by doing that, the trees are naturally gonna blow back and forth a little as the plane goes by. So some of the lasers are gonna go all the way down to the ground. So what that means is you can ultimately map an entire Maya site uh, as if the trees weren't there. It's like seeing through the jungle, even though it's really not. You're just, you know, as long as there's a little bit of a breeze, you're seeing where the leaves aren't. Um, and so that's really aided a lot in the mapping of Maya sites. Now, if you're watching National Geographic or Discovery Channel, a lot of times they're like, secret Maya site that the archaeologists never knew. And it's like, yeah, no, the, the more honest response is site archaeologists already knew that we have a better map of than we did last time. <laughs> you know, that's that's what it really is. And that's actually a very good thing. It's nice because we can like kind of cross check our older maps and um, realize there are certain portions of it. And by site, I mean, like an entire Maya city. You, you can literally be like, oh, my God, we didn't see that one part that happened to us. On one of the projects, after the LIDAR went over, we're like, oh, my God, there's an extra part over there we never mapped, you know? So things like that are really, really uh, exciting, and it makes it makes our job easier and more fun. I really like having a LIDAR map. Um, LIDAR maps are not magic. You still need real people on the ground to walk through and check out and make sure that that um, what the LIDAR is seeing is actually a Maya site and not a hill or, you know, this kind of thing. So um that's probably the number one kind of what, what's new in my archaeology in the last handful of years yeah and that, that brings me to one of my questions is um what are some of the roadblocks that can get in the way of going and starting a dig at a site because it sounds like from what you're telling me that that archaeologists know where these sites are it's just a matter of you know is it getting the funding or is it other uh, projects that are commercial projects in the way i'm sure there are a number of different things um, can I choose D all of the above? Is that is that possible? Yeah. Um, because it's like in terms of roadblocks, it's it's everything. Like like I I often say every year is different. Like like again, I counted it up recently and I've been to Belize 17 different times, right? Every one of those 17 times was different. It was uh different funding again in terms of roadblocks, like hey, maybe the funding didn't go through. Maybe you had to get funding from another source. Maybe you had to cancel the project at the last minute. So the funding's different. The permits, maybe the permits sailed through or maybe they didn't. And by permits, just because I have a big PhD, I can't just grab a shovel and dig it on my site, right? I have to go through the legal process of getting 
permits from the government, from the landowner, whatever it may be, right? Some years it's easy. Some years it's impossible. Some years it's in between. Um, the weather, some uh, in the jungle, there's a rainy season. And the rainy season usually comes mm, around July 1st, give or take. And when the rainy, rainy season comes, the rainy season comes. Like the roads, oh, now they're all washed out. You know, oh, the river, oh, you can't cross that anymore. You know, so it's a real big problem, the weather. Um, and you're really, you'll see archaeology projects down in Central America. By the time mid-June comes by, they are scrambling to get done because uh, once it gets really, really bad, it's it, you just got to stop. So the um, the permitting process, the grant process, the environment, um, even sometimes what you find, like uh, you could you could find um, human burials or something where human burials, people might think that an archaeologist would be like, yes, human burial, but in my experience and for myself personally, it's usually the opposite is true. Like if, if we discover, you know, human remains, if, if you swung the camera over to my face, right, right then I'd be like, Oh no. You know, because what that means is a lot more rules, you know, a lot more laws come into place just, and this is internationally, it's depending on where you're working. You got to slow way down. You got to deal with it respectfully, you know? So funnily enough, sometimes we hope we don't find human bear. You know, just because it, it it makes the rest of the project smoother if you if you don't. So I, I can just go on and on. There's there's so many roadblocks. Being sick, like you you know, wow, this isn't just a cold. You got sick, and they don't know what you have. Um, <laughs> I've had that before. Sickness where you don't know. Uh, uh, so that can be something. So it really is. Um, something will go. It's management of roadblocks is actually a big part of an archaeology project. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it sounds like also that uh, just the physical terrain is a big factor, too, and that you need sure. to kind of have a certain amount of outdoorsman skills, I would imagine. Is that something yes. you already had when you began these field trips, or is that something I, you developed over time? I, I was not a mountain man or something like that, you know, but I and I hadn't done like extreme tent camping or something like that. Not at all. I would just say I had like, average skills i wasn't afraid of the natural world that's a big part of it and i just learned it over time like working working with the like local belizean guys and stuff like that we always hire like local guys to come work with us and they are an indispensable part of the crew so i really enjoyed my time just it was like childlike learning i would like mimic them in terms of how to swing a machete through the jungle and not get too tired how to kind of pace yourself throughout the day to not like destroy yourself you know th things like that um that was a really important component in learning that stuff and just as the years go by you just learn it what, what's so funny is I, I could regale you about stories about like extreme camping that i've done in the jungle but people tend to think i like camping i don't not not really if there was a hotel there i would stay there but there's no hotel man so uh i I, you have to camp out in necessity, you know, or sleep in a hammock or whatever. No, I don't hate it, but I just I do it because it's required. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we had a good question here come in from Francesco, something I was going to ask as well as what are some tropes about archaeologists and archaeology in general that you see in fiction that you would like to see less of? Let's see less of. Um, here's what I would say to that. And I, I don't mean this to be a dodge. And you can ask a follow-up question if you want. Um, I don't mind um, really wild stories about archaeology, like Indiana Jones and that kind of stuff. I love Indiana Jones. Um, but that because it's fiction. What kills me is stuff that is played off as nonfiction. Stuff like the Graham Hancock stuff of the world, like Ancient Apocalypse or something like that, where, they, where they're like, well, it could have happened. No, it didn't. It didn't. The chances of that are zero, you know, but they play it off as like, this is real. That's what kills me. I, I'm happy with Hollywood. Like, go to town. Tomb Raider, make another one. Mummy, make five of them. You know, they're fun. Why not? They're they're fiction. So that's what really kills me. I, I don't mind at all, like, 
the thousand times people have joked and asked me, you know, how, what's it like to run at, uh, in front of a huge ball, you know, a huge boulder. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, whatever, that's fine. That's fine. Par for the course. I'm happy to joke along, you know, but the, but the fake stuff masquerading as the real is the, is the real problem. Oh yeah. I mean, that's like the history channel, they show the ancient aliens. So, oh, everything was built by aliens. On the that history to drive archaeologists channel. And <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just, again, I don't, it's funny. Ancient aliens is so over the top that sometimes I don't mind. Cause I'm like, eh, your average person doesn't really believe that they're watching just for a laugh. And, and so I don't mind that, but some of the stuff that like, like, again, some of the Graham Hancock stuff, like, like ancient apocalypse on Netflix, that is, is super sneaky. Cause it's totally like devoid of facts, but it feels like it's real. Yes. And it's just, it's just, it's cruel to the audience, you know, it's just because they just, he's a total shyster, you know, and so it's just, it's not very nice. I, I would say as a follow up to that, do you, do you think that maybe there's a, a positive impact in having these kinds of over the top Indiana Jones, Tomb Raider like films out there that maybe it inspires more people to become archaeologists? Sure. Even if the reality I have is no like that. <laughs> Absolutely. I have, again, I have no problem with that. When I was a kid, I watched Indiana Jones in the theater when I was like eight or something, you know, and it's probably 4% of the reason I'm here today. You know, it seems cool. Anything that makes your discipline seem cool, especially if you're like an academic discipline that could seem totally nerdy and boring. Like, dude, you need to grab on with both hands and hold tight. If Harrison Ford is your poster child, come on, man. You know, like <laughs> I, I, it, it bothers bothers me when archaeologists are like oh i just so angry at the indiana jones come on no 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 no. that's cool you know I, I i again i appreciate the general public i know they know that my job is not exactly like indiana jones every day you know yeah. all right that's good to hear um mm -hmm. let's see another good question from the audience and thank you everyone for uh, participating and giving us lots of good material yeah, this is get. great um, so someone asked a good question here. Can you share an example of when a discovery refuted or debunked a solid theory you'd operated under up until that point? Ooh. Off the top. Oh. Yeah. So something, something that like changed kind of the overarching, you know, um, let's see. So, so, something that changed. Well, I can just say, I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, first, the the example just personally of the lidar going over one of the sites i worked at and be like oh crap there's a whole other part to this you know <laughs> that that totally changed we're like whoa um and there there's a couple others like um peopling of the new world which 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 is the first time this big question in archaeology which i think is the number one hardest thing to uh answer of all which is like when did human beings first get into the americas north and south america there's good evidence up to about 17,000 years ago. Looks like, you know, 17,000 years ago is the first time human beings came across the Bering Land Bridge and into, like, across into Alaska and then down into the Americas for the first time ever. Um, that number used to be lower. It was more like 12,000. So there have been a handful of finds in the last mm, 20 years that have pushed that. And and those those are really cool. That's what people who don't like archaeologists much always say that we don't like that or something. We love it. We love it when there's new information. We love it when it changes the story of the past, as long as it's like good factual information. So there are sites sites like that. Um, oh, th th there's ones. There's famous ones like the Kennewick Man case. Some of you might have heard of that. That was that skeleton was 9,300 years old. That was just very impressive and um it turned out that Kennewick man was buried that was really interesting for it so you have a 9300 year old uh person very early in the Americas but who was he didn't just die at the side of a river he was buried he was put there you know by by his friends and family you know uh, we think so little things like that are really great and they just sort of add to what we know about the past I mean we didn't think of it in a certain way you know so that, those are the ones off the top of my head, which I would say that really changed um, our our thinking, you know. Uh, let's see. There's another good question from an attendee here. Uh, what do the locals near your field projects feel or how do they react to what you're doing? 
Have you ever met with, with any significant conflict? Um, and if so, how did you manage it in a culturally sensitive manner? Uh, in in Belize, we have like very good relationships with the lo with the local uh, people. How it usually goes is the archaeology site is we, we usually work with people who are live in the village who is that are closest to the archaeological site. If that if that makes sense. So um, we are smart in our hiring, meaning a, a village is is a very small place and so if you have a bunch of jobs for the people of that village note to self don't hire everyone from one family you know <laughs> because then it totally destroys the the balance in that village and everyone's pissed at that one family you know spread the wealth and and hire a bit from all the uh, all the families make friends you know, be friendly, res you know, little things, this is going to be shocking, but little things like personal respect, like respecting other people and oh my God, like listening to them, whatever. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I do have a PhD, but, uh, you know, I listen to them. I just, I take their point of view seriously because they know better about living in the jungle than I do. You know, I know better about living in the jungle than you, but they know a lot better than me. Uh, so I, it's, it's literally all that stuff you learned in kindergarten. Like, you know, you make friends, you just treat people with respect, you listen to them and you like, and you have a two way street. And when there's a problem, you work on it together. That doesn't mean I don't disagree with uh, some of the local people we work with sometimes, but they understand that and they respect me too. You know, so in terms of, I, I think some of you might be thinking of that like sort of cliche where the, where the, oh, the, the local people are angry, you know, and ha hatred of archaeologists. Actually, that happens much less than you think. The only times it does, those are the ones the media covers because they want the story. Very unfortunately, as I've gotten old and cranky in archaeology, I've noticed that the, I really have noticed that the media tries, like goes for stories of conflict like that. And they don't even cover all the ones, which are most of them, where we all work together and everything's cool because it just is not as exciting. So uh, anyway, that's my experience. That is unfortunate. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we have a good question here from Sharon asking, where do you stand on archaeology tourism and how would I get into it? Um, first, I, I'm not sure what you mean by how you get into it. Like maybe, you you know, how do you go, how do you go in as a tourist? How do you work in it? I don't know. But um, how, where do I stand on archaeology? Uh, tourism is a fact of archaeology that you must deal with. Right. And so I'm not here to be like, um, well, nobody gets to go to Pompeii anymore. Sorry, my, 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 close Pompeii. You can't <laughs> do that. What you have to do, because then everyone's pissed. And it's nice that that tourists, that the general public wants to learn. So what you have to do is manage the tourism. And you, you just have to be smart in terms of how you let people experience the site, what you you let them touch and don't touch where you let them walk and don't walk because uh most archaeology sites are inherently brittle so even walking on it can like destroy them over time so you just there's a there's a very fine balancing act there and um the more that archaeologists learn about tourism the better uh, i always make my students like if we're working somewhere and there are tourists i force my students to to do the tours <laughs> and they always hate it and i'm like no this is great because they have to take the you know the general public around you got to talk about each each of the things you got to make it palatable to the public you can't just use a bunch of weird academic jargon that's boring and strange you got to like talk and 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 through that you know um show them the interest and the excitement of the ancient past so uh that's a very important thing you brought up sort of tourism and archaeology and so i am um I am very much for managed smart tourism because it's going to happen. And also with that, money comes with that too. And that money you can use to um, make the site a little safer and, and, and that kind of stuff. You can hire maybe a guard so there isn't looting anymore or uh, something like that. So it's something that you can't be so high and mighty where you're like, oh, tourism, stop it. You know, you, no, it's there. Manage it, work with it, figure it out. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, question here asking, uh, wondering about privately funded digs and how they impact positively or negatively the work done under a formal research focused effort. Um, 
any funding's good funding. You have a <laughs> you have a secret private donor who wants to give me money. Give them my name. Um, and and actually, when I came back, what I said early on about every year is different on an archaeology project. It, it, with that, it's every funding group is different. Sometimes it's very um, straightforward or obvious or cliche, like a National Science Foundation. You know, we got one of those once or twice in some of the projects I worked for. Um, National Geographic, right? Stuff you, you're like, oh, that's how it's supposed to be. But if you get a private donor, no archaeologist I know would deny that. Everyone's cool with that. It's it, There's nothing negative about that because you still have to go through the permitting process if that makes sense like you still have to get the okay from the correct authorities so where you get the money is almost secondary you know it's it's about uh getting getting the correct permits and then if you have the money to push it through then then that's fine so i i personally have no no problem with that unless unless for some weird reason that the private rich donor wa wa had stipulations like you know and then I get to build a mansion in the middle of the plaza in the Maya site, you know, something crazy like that. But I, I've never experienced that personally. Yeah, that's great. Uh, let's see. We have a good, good question here asking um, if you were to switch your research onto different regions or populations or civilizations, is there one in particular that really interests you? Um, I would say... I've had a magical, very happy career so far. Um, so in terms of research, I wouldn't change too much. But what I would say is I would love uh, this. This would be fantastic. If I could just be a tourist, uh, uh, like in Egypt or something, float down the Nile, go see Giza. I've never been to Egypt. And like, as soon as I say that, everyone's like, you're just not a real archaeologist. So <laughs> haven't been to Egypt, loser. Um, but I would love to like experience those sites just like by myself and nobody know who I am and nobody asks me anything. You know, because <laughs> when you get further up in archaeology, you're, you're directing a project or whatever. Everyone's asking you stuff all the time and you're, you know, you have to run the project. And that's the job, which is fine. But sometimes you just don't want no pressure. It's just shoulders down. I just want to enjoy this for what it is. So my my dream would be to visit some of those places. Like I would love Egypt's way near the top of my list. Just every fill in every cliche of Egypt. I'd love to do that. Um, there's there's other ones that I would just like. Even um, Cahokia, which is in the United States in the St. Louis area. It's the largest um, mounds that Native American cultures in North America made. I've never seen Cahokia and I, I would love to see the that just so i'd love to experience things as a tourist in terms of being an archaeologist and starting another project i i i wouldn't i don't have too much interest in doing that okay that makes sense yeah um let's see i have a question for you is um since your research is related to the maya how interconnected were the uh societies in this in this era of the kind of the classical period of the maya like were they communicating with a lot of other larger societies in the area or so it depends on, on how far you want to go the mesoamerican world which is like the maya plus um central mexico like teotihuacan and that kind of stuff those are all interrelated like if you look at at mesoamerica this is not south america right this is north of panama um there there's relationships all over the place so that you can trace you can find actual artifacts you know and this kind of stuff so i would say that relationship is quite strong as you go further from there it's less and less like um you can find um like evidence from maya contact even in the southwest um you know, you know like uh snake town has a has a ball court there's a couple other there's a couple places in the American Southwest that have like ball courts. And I'm using my little quotes because I visited one of them. And I have to say, I, I've been in a million Maya ball courts. I, I didn't feel the love. <laughs> I know that's not the most scientific way to talk about it, but I'm not saying they weren't ball courts, but they were an idea that came from the Maya world that has been so changed. It's their own thing now, you know, so. I'm not here to say that they had some sort of messengers running from the Maya world up to the American Southwest or something. There's just kind of a, you get these cultural tendrils that have spread out, but I wouldn't really call it like 
direct all the con time contract uh, contact. You do find um, macaw bones, big you know, big parrots, uh, macaw bones in northern northern Mexico, almost into Texas. So they were trading up macaws from Central America. That's a long way. That's pretty cool. So you do find really interesting things like that, or like for the Chumash, which is the local Southern California native culture you'll find some of their shell beads like way out several states over through trade and stuff but in terms of um like direct cultural interaction once you get a ways out there's not too much and and there there is none between something like peru and you know the mesoamerica or something like that there's not you're looking at other times other places interesting yeah. Um, let's see. We have another good question here. Uh, someone's asking, do you have one specific discovery or moment that you consider the most important or impactful of your career thus far? Um, there's a couple that it, it just depends on how I talk about them, like the cenotes. So I'm really proud of the cenote stuff. And it's because nobody did cenotes in Belize until me. I really am version 1.0 of that i'm not saying i'm the first to do cenotes in the mesoamerican world i'm not they did a bunch of them they did a bunch of it before in like the northern yucatan and stuff but in belize i'm the guy <laughs> it feels funny to say but it, and it's just this happy um confluence of events where um i happened to work with dr lisa lucero through my entire master's and phd career she was so great we had a uh area of Belize a survey area. And it just happened to have those 25 cenotes in it. And I asked her, Lisa, you know, Hey, how about if I do this for my master's thesis? And she okayed it. And I went on, and I've worked more in my, for my PhD. So just because environmentally, we happen to have these cenotes in our area. And I had a background in scuba diving already. So I was like, I could just naturally do it. So that the bringing of the Belizean cenotes forward in the minds of people that i would say that is something that i just i that'll be chiseled on my tombstone if that makes sense here lies dr andrew kinkella cenote of belize dude you know um so there's that and then there's other things like, like finding a maya pyramid nobody knew of before you know stuff like that is like that ain't every day man but that happened it wasn't super tall it was like it was like 40 feet tall, maybe, but it was built on a on a hill. So when you got to it was sort of like the Maya head, there was a hill and the Maya had sort of flattened it and then put the pyramid on above it. So when you get to the top of the of pyramid, that's only 35 or 40 feet tall. When you look down, it's like 100 feet down. So it was very like impressive. Nobody ever recorded that. I was the first, you know, so that things like that are um, just career moments I can really think of. So, yes, I've worked on burials before. And yes, I've, you know, like I found a. I was working with a group. We found like a jade ear spool, you know, uh, cool. that an ancient Maya person would have worn, stuff like that. But that isn't as near and dear to my heart as like the cenote stuff or the time that found the pyramid. You know, like that, that's <laughs> it, the, those are the things that that I'm that I just those are the golden moments for me, if that makes sense. Is there anything that stands out in your mind when you were going to do the dives into the cenotes? Did you discover anything? particularly cool or interesting oh, man yeah. you know what stands out to me off the top of my head as you ask is the very first time we ever went it man talk about a jump into the unknown you know <laughs> like nobody had done this i had don't do this at home children uh i i had i think this was probably like my ninth dive ever and so i had my dive certification but i'm um, early days i was very careful about it but just going diving in a place where you just don't know anything. And you, I mean, you're doing your best to be safety and stuff, but just diving down that was like, Oh my God, what are we doing? And, and then finding one broken pot shirt. So a broken piece of my pottery. That's all we found in the first dive, but one pot shirt is more than enough, you know, to be like, Oh, they were like having ritual here and throwing ceramics in here from time to time. So that is something that sort of stands out in my mind when I think of, you know, diving in that world. Oh, wow. That's got to be such an exhilarating feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, try to get to some more questions here. Um, someone's asking, uh, wondering if while at UCSB, in addition to your international field work, 
if you're able to do any local Chumash digs, which I think you you spoke about a bit. Yes. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, and and, and a lot. Um, I'm a big fan for anyone who's interested in archaeology, who's going forward in archaeology. Yes, 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 you, you can do your, like, romantic uh, summer in the jungle or or whatever, but I wish it was required for all archaeologists to get a background in whatever their local archaeology is. I always took that very seriously. And I also kind of have a split brain where I do have all the Maya stuff. And like I said, my tombstone will be the Maya stuff. But, but I've also done a lot of like local Chumash work. Um, I, I've worked in that world, like with my students. I've, I worked in that world when I was a student. There's a, a portion of archaeology called CRM, which is cultural resource management, which is um, kind of the business side of archaeology. If people are building a like a strip mall they hire an archaeologist to come out and make sure that there's not an Indian burial ground there or something. And I always, I wish that all archaeologists did that. And so I had a couple of years where I worked for firms like that and did that kind of stuff. So yeah, I had a, um, a lot of background working in the Chumash world and I really um, enjoyed it. And, and even on top of that, it's super nice to have experiences in like two different worlds. So you can point counterpoint them the chumash world and the maya world right and so because sometimes you learn something here you didn't learn over here and and vice versa or you can fr bring stuff you learned over here over to this one you know so um yeah and and i just put an exclamation point on that one please please all archaeologists out there get experience in your local ar archaeology whatever it may be that will only pay dividends in the future oh absolutely um, so that uh, kind of relates to this question. Someone's wondering, um, I know you, you mentioned that there's uh, seasons for these digs that often. Yeah. Um, so how much of your time is spent in the field versus in the office or in the lab? Um, it's a complex question. There's, there's so much stuff. So whew, the short answer to a very varied uh, existence is me as as an academic archaeologist, I guess I'd call myself that, although I'm a little different than most because I work at a community college. Um, the So uh, uh, an excavation, you would you would do that in the summer. Usually, if at any university you're at, if you look at the archaeology department at the end of the spring semester, they are scrambling because they want to get out of there as soon as possible, right? Because because they need to go to their dig site or whatever before the rains come or before the money runs out, you know, whatever it is. So there's a, the the field season. All you, you think of it like, oh, when's the field season start? Um, you know, May, June, July, like it's it's in that world. But the rest of the year, um, an academic archaeologist is teaching classes or working in the lab. Um, they might, if they're working local, they might be doing something a little in the field, you know, one day a week or something, but it's, there's a lot of variability there. Um, so, but year by year, sure. You're spending much more time in an office or lab than you are just sleeping in a hammock or something like that, you know, <laughs> because you have to, you have to be a professional and you have to deal with whatever artifacts you find, you know, once you are done you can't just dig 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 and then throw them in a pile somewhere you know you have to deal with deal with the artifacts deal with curation that's where you keep them where you keep them you know where you're going to store them what are you going to do um how you going to organize them got to make a catalog of them you know all that all that kind of stuff so there's a big portion of that too and of course teaching and you know working with students and so um it's it's varied but definitely more office lab than than field Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, question here from Kat asking, have you ever encountered any archaeologists in South America looking for Latter-day Saint historical sites? <laughs> um, uh, so this is Central I, I and I don't mean to, you know, belabor this point or something. So this is Central America, not South America, right? So so the Maya area is Central, and they say South America, that's like Peru, you know, uh, Brazil, that kind of stuff. So in Central America, have I encountered like Latter-day Saints looking for stuff? Personally, no, but there are there is a portion that they do fund archaeological projects. And that is like a really funny um, ethical dilemma for that archaeologist, because you have to go with the data. You can't go, oh, what I've uncovered is these pyramids are where Jesus came. <laughs> no, they're not. You know, and I and I 
again, you, you have to be honest with your data, you know, but what I've seen is archaeologists who work in that world, they are very conscious of um, like uh, facts and stuff. And, and really they just use the money from that institution in order to do like good archaeology. So, so good for them, but man, I, I don't know what those meetings are like behind closed doors. <laughs> um, question here from Tyler asking, is Tikal still being excavated? All the time is the answer, but Tikal is huge. So you're not necessarily seeing um, excavations in Temple 4 or something like Temple 4 is the big one. Temple 4 is the one that's in um, uh, Star Wars where they're, where they're actually looking at the Millennium Falcon fly by, right? That's from the top of Temple 4. So while... Not, the big pyramids aren't going to be excavated every year and talk about, about tourism. They're always dealing with tourism at Tikal. There's going to be little uh, excavations going on here and there. It's just a massive site. Like think of, I don't know the population in essence, 50,000 people, you know, it's a big city. So think about, you know, is LA still being excavated this year? It's like, well, maybe not the skyscrapers, but Hey, out in Azusa where we have a couple things going on. Makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. let's see. I had a good question here. Um, ooh, this is an interesting one. Okay. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, have you ever felt pressured from institutions or governments to soften facts or omit discovered facts to protect cultures, reputations, or anything to that degree? Um, my quick, I'm thinking about it. My quick answer is no. Um, I mean, I, I can think of a perfect storm scenario, you know, in certain places where maybe if you found a thing and saw a thing, maybe it just wouldn't go over well. But that's never happened in my experience. I've, I've never gotten a pressure, but also I'm pretty, I'm just pretty bold. I'm like, look, here's what I found. Uh, anyway, you know, uh, and so I haven't, I haven't felt that personally. I can't, and I can't think of a good example where I've really seen that. I will say this just about every archaeologist I've ever met, and I know many of them, archaeologists is a small world, um, they are honest, um, scientific-minded people who want to tell you the truth. Th the idea of an archaeologist secretly softening things for big oil or something, you know, I, I, I've never encountered that in my career. Um, I've just seen people, even people who interpersonally I can't stand, they're, <laughs> they're good archaeologists, you know, so um, I'm very like proud of my friends and colleagues. They they do a good job. Well, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So um, you, you mentioned LIDAR and some of the other technologies that are now at your disposal. Um, do you think that we're kind of entering a, or have we already entered a golden age of archaeology? And um, could you also just uh, tell, tell the, the public some of the most significant archaeological finds of the last 10 years or so? Sure. I think I think it's I think it is a golden age of archaeology with it with an edge, with a caveat being in archaeology, we destroy what we study. And what I mean by that, as soon as an archaeology site is uncovered, like it's being actively ruined. And it's not because archaeology is trying to ruin it. It's even stuff like once it's exposed to the air, it just starts to, you know, fall apart. So it's a golden age, but why? It's because, you know, there's so many people on the earth. We're doing so much, so much construction. We're digging up so much stuff that it's just, we are, un, we are uncovering more earth than ever before. So you're going to find more stuff. And then with the, it's a double whammy with that plus the technology, you're just finding more and more and more stuff. So it is a golden age in terms of finding stuff. It may not necessarily be a golden age of preserving stuff. <laughs> you know, but so stuff is coming up all the time. Um, and and that part is exciting. And I will say in terms of current, like recent archaeological ex uh, discoveries, there were certain things found I, I never thought they would find. Like, like I'm a big semi-secret, not really secret fan of Shackleton's boat journey, which is Ernest Shackleton, when it famous. He tried to make it to the South Pole in like 1917. Oh, yes. Yeah, and he didn't make it. And so his... Um, the the story is famous because he never made it, but nobody died, right? But it was this awful trek of three years. Their their ship, the Endurance. I thought, and dude, I'm I tend I would say I'm a pretty positive person, but I was like, never, they're never gonna find. No, just stop looking. But 
they found the endurance. And I was like, oh my God. Like I thought never in my life am I going to see this. So the endurance, some of the other shipwreck stuff too, like um, on the other side near the North Pole, there's the Franklin expedition that was from the 1840s. They all died. That was different. There, 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 there. That's a man. If you want a depressing story for your Saturday night, Franklin expedition. Um, <laughs> there are two ships, the Erebus and the Terror. Same thing. I was like, never. And then they so they found the Erebus. And then I was like, they're never gonna find the terror. And then they found the terror too. I'm like, oh, oh my god, good for you. So they found those. Um, Richard the third, which is hilarious. He was underneath a parking lot, you know. But that's archaeology. I love the example of Richard the third. That's another one I thought, never, 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 never. Um, so even in my you know, skepticism. I love it when they find that kind of stuff. You know, I'm always excited. Never like, you know, people, again, people who don't like archaeologists be like, archaeologists don't like it when you find stuff that they don't expect. No, you can't be more wrong. <laughs> we love it when you find stuff we don't expect. Like, I'm all over the Erebus and the Terror. I'm all over Richard III. That's just, it's awesome. What a great story. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of my favorite parts mm -hmm. of just uh, being as a lay person observing all, you know, follow archaeologists' news on Twitter yeah. and find that there's always things being found. So I That's love the cool. fact that the story is always being written. It's just never complete. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so we have a good question here. Uh, also a bit of a comment saying, uh, you do a lot of public outreach and thank you for this presentation. Um, what advice do you have for people who are trying to learn the technology and communication skills to do what you're doing? And how is it important to make sure the public has an understanding of anthropology and archaeology? Whoa. All right. This is going to take me approximately two weeks to uh, answer. Um, there's a lot there. Um, and what I would say right back at you with the thanks of thanks for be taking that seriously. Here's what I would say. I'm going to try and make this as succinct as, as, as I can, because this is massive. And this is something close to my heart, too. So um, I always I enjoy doing public outreach. I think it's vital. I am embarrassed that so few archaeologists do true public outreach. They define public outreach as I blew some dust off my dissertation and published it as an edited volume that nobody read. That was public. out. It's like, no, it wasn't. Get out there. Um, I mean, the the pseudo archaeologists, you know, the BSers like Graham Hancock and those guys, they do great public outreach. Ancient aliens guys, great public outreach. So archaeologists stop complaining about that and just do public outreach you know get out there so how do you do this however you can does that mean starting your own youtube channel sure you know does that mean starting a blog where you just like write stuff about archaeology sure does that mean you know um uh starting um any any social media outlet you know um does that mean getting more involved in a local archaeology organization does that mean doing presentations like this like for you know anywhere in the general public does that mean doing presentations for like a sixth grade class yes yes to all yes to all yes to all and i think what a lot of um archaeo and this goes for any academic um be it archaeology be it geology you know any any of us who've done those things have Really amazing, awesome stories that nobody else on your block has done. So don't be afraid to tell your personal story. It's intrinsically interesting because you'll think, you know, you'll you'll get worried and be like, well, I only worked in a cornfield in Iowa doing archaeology for a month. Who's going to care about that? A lot of people. It's awesome. You know, so that's something you have to get over. You have to get over your like reticence and just go for it. I'll tell you this, this is maybe my last bit on this. Um, so I have this YouTube channel, right? Can Kella teaches archeology. span um, I've been doing it for about five years. The reason I started, I, I was very scared to do it for like three years. Like I just kept thinking like, should I do it? Should I do it? Oh my God. Am I going to look like a jerk? Am I going to look like a tool? But I had this moment in my office where I was just like, screw it. I'm doing it. And then I'm telling you for the first like six months or maybe year, I would put up a video like once every, I don't know, a week or two weeks or three weeks. And I felt like I was just 
shouting into a cave. I'm like, is this good? Do I look like a moron? I have no idea, but I just kept doing it. And um, as a good friend of mine, who is actually the theater professor at Moore Park, where I teach, he's one of my one of my best friends. He once off the cuff said, you know, you know, Andrew, content is king. <laughs> Truer words have never been said. So whatever you do in public outreach, keep doing it. Content is king. Write that blog post. Write five blog posts. Just keep doing it. We need it desperately. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, still have a little time for some more questions. Um, sure. So I talk all night. <laughs> Uh, we spoke a little bit about some of the potential roadblocks that get in the way of, of an archaeo archaeological dig. I'm curious, uh, hypothetically, if we were to remove any kind of roadblocks and you could just start a dig wherever you like, is there any sites that you wish like, man, I wish I could just start digging there right now? <laughs> you know, um, this is going to be an unsatisfying answer to this question. So be beware. Here it comes. Very unsatisfying. <laughs> um because I've had so many good things happen for me in my career. Like I work where I like, I don't have, it's kind of like I said before, how I would just go like on vacation to these different places to check them out. Um, I don't have a magic place where I'm like, what if, um, if, if all roadblocks are removed, you know what I would do? I would work in the same place, but in much greater comfort, you know, like <laughs> I'd be like, you know what? I'm going to buy three pickup trucks and then I'm going to stay in the nice hotel and then I'm going to fly home on the weekends. It's going to be awesome. You know, so I would make I would make my current situation just like 10 times more comfortable. That would be great. Like that, that, that would be that's my dream. You know, just keep working in Belize, keep doing my thing. But like just just first class all the way. Right. That that that's what I truly would want. Um, on top of that, there's always other other places like I always have respect for like grad students who will work somewhere that most people don't like. What about the state of Nevada? How many? people? And there's so much cool stuff in places like that, like the Great Basin area of the United States. Everyone r runs to Belize or they run to the southwest or whatever, like go to places where there's not much going on. Learn about that. We need more archaeology done in those places. You know, I'm not saying there's nothing done in Nevada, but there's a lot of room to, you know, to do more, to, to learn more. So those kind of places I think could be really, really cool. Interesting. Um, let's see. We have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question from Kat. Uh, what is a good undergraduate degree to pursue before a high level degree when a person wants to get into archaeology? Um, how, how that works in terms of degrees is undergraduate, it's going to be an anthropology degree. So I like to call anthropology the parent corporation. So <laughs> anthro is like an umbrella that has four subfields. It's biological anthro, cultural anthro, archaeology, and linguistics. So in the United States, like every degree I have says anthropology if indiana jones if you looked at indiana jones's degrees they would be anthro degrees so it's because anthro is simply the study of people and then archaeology is just the study of people of the past you know so you're using the same ideas but you're projecting them into the past so it's an anthro degree 100 percent. almost every place has some sort of anthro degree happening um obviously if you were somewhere where there was truly nothing Something like history is very close. Um, there's aspects of sociology that are very close, but but I would really double down and just try and get stuff in the anthro world. You know, it, um, early on, like taking a cultural anthropology class or a biological anthro class or forensics. Um, there's never anything wrong with that. Even a geology class is great. Uh, stratigraphy is good to know in archaeology. <laughs> That's great. Um, let's see. I'll just uh, I'll wrap up with another question related to your area of research. Um, I think people understand. I think most people know that uh, the Maya is a really fascinating civilization, but I feel like compared to European civilizations, it maybe does not get as much limelight. And there's a lot of things people don't know. What's uh, what's something really fascinating about the Maya that you think your average person should know but probably doesn't? Uh, I I think it's just the view in general. And and what I mean by that is, okay, if you look at Europe, 
um, Europe has a bunch of countries in it, right? And we tend to know, okay, there's France and there's Germany and there's Spain, you know, you can go all these different countries. If you look at the Maya and, and also just, let's just say North America too, um, there, are, there are different cultures throughout Mesoamerica and into North America. It's the same idea as Europe. So like if you're talking about North America and you say like the Indians or the Native Americans, it's like, what do you mean? It's the exact same thing as saying, well, you know what the Europeans are like, do you? Who do you mean? The Germans, the French? Like you see, there's so there's so much variety. I think that's what people miss sometimes. They just kind of think that like, well, there's Native Americans in North America and they had like Buffalo and then, oh, well, there's like, other cultures in Central America and they have like pyramids and that's it. It's like, no, 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 no. There's so much variety, right? That's that. If I, I had one thing that I'd want to preach, it's like, learn that it's so fascinating. And it also comes back to um, learn your local, learn your local archeology, span learn your local history, right? Way back. And I, I don't mean just the last hundred years. I mean, the last 15,000 years, you know, of your local history. Like that's the fascinating, that's the good stuff. Mm, right. And so, in the Maya world, it kind of goes like that, that they're not uh, the, the, the Maya people, just like any people on earth are just like you and me. They worried about the same stuff. They wanted a safe neighborhood. They, you know, they wanted, they didn't want taxes too high. They, they uh, loved their children. You know, they felt like you and I, they weren't just these one dimensional humans who prayed to the sun or something, you know, they, they were normal. They joked. They, they had dances and music and, they got drunk and you know like that totally we have uh proof of all this stuff you know so just that they were multi-dimensional people just like you and me it's great well we've run out of time unfortunately but i just want to say oh. thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me it was your uh, enthusiasm and passion on this topic is really infectious and makes me want to learn more um i hope everyone in attendance felt the same way also, just want to thank everyone uh, in attendance for asking such good questions. Uh, yeah, it was a really uh, great discussion. Yeah, I, I would just like to add again, thank you guys so much. It, it, it's so much easier for me when the audience just asks questions. You guys answered uh, like asked like a ton, so that just it it really helps me, you know, react. And I will also say, if um, if I didn't get to your question, if you want to ask me more, you can always go to my YouTube channel. It's Kinkella Teaches Archaeology, and you can just leave a comment on like any of the videos, because because I get the comments, I kind of get like a master list of comments, you know, so you can just kind of leave it there. And and I'll I'll do my best to like kind of write you a quick answer afterwards. Or if you want to get in touch with me for, you know, archaeology questions, always feel free. I'm always happy to answer that stuff. Great. Well, thanks again, Dr. Kinkiller. Really appreciate you taking the time. And thank you to everyone in attendance. Um, hope to see you at some yeah. of the upcoming Sci-Fi September events and enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, it was Thank super you. fun. Thanks, guys. All righty.